I'm right now Associate Dean for Research, which is actually an administrative job. I look after a college of engineering which has seven engineering departments. And I have uh, over, like, oversee more than 180 faculty members working in seven departments. Again, the thing I would like to mention is, again, the topic is going to be on sustainability and geothermal energy studies in geotechnical engineering. Before I start talking about this thing, I really want to thank uh, Deepanjan for giving this uh, uh, you know, nice, wise lecture and chance to meet Armagan, which is really nice. And again, wonderful folks. I know I am between you and your, your long three-day weekend. I didn't know that this is a, uh, what do you call a Thanksgiving in Canada. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know? So on a Friday afternoon for you guys to come here, spend. But hopefully, I'll, I'll say something that may interest you a little bit. OK? We'll see. Right? So, and we do have a, a center. This is our research center for excellence, sustainable and resilient civil infrastructure. I know you're working in sustainability and resiliency, so you may have interest in that. And then we just got a new site, which is an NSF site. It's a National Science Foundation. It works similar to what you do in, uh, here in Canada. You have most of your research grants have an industry partnership. In US, we don't. But US is moving towards that model, which is having an industry partnering with the government agencies to fund a, a research center at a university. So this is my center. It's called CICI, which is actually stands for Center for Integration of Composites in Infrastructure. And again, uh, that's the center we just started. It's actually four months old now. Okay? So if you have more information, you can go to this website here. It'll give you a little bit of what we do here. So these are some of the outlines here. I have two sections of presentation. I wish I had put more on this section, but again, I was more focusing on this part, which is sustainability part. So I talk about sustainability in geotech and pavement engineering. I know many of you are geotech uh, grad students, so it will interest you. And then pavement engineering. And when, I, when we started this sustainability in geotech, Deepanjan played a very major integral role. Uh, the reason is we have two societies. One is the American Society of Civil Engineers, which I am part of a group called Sustainability in Geotech Committee. And he is now vice chair. Uh, I was kicked out because I have a leadership position. So he became a vice chair. And he's taking care of the, this committee, which is a very important committee. The way we run our conferences every year is basically through these committees. Committees do the you know, conference sessions, and we invite all the you know, cutting edge topics, hot button topics. We provide all the sessions, and we bring people from all over the country or all over the world to come and give presentations at once a year in the ASC National Conference. The other one is the international one, which is the one we just spoke with uh, one of your students here. The one last year was in Paris. We first time we created a sustainability in geotech technical committee. It's called TC307. He is the actually started that committee, TC307. If you have a chance, please look at it. That's a very important committee, in my opinion, because when we started, we didn't know what kind of reception we will get. And unbelievably, like we have so many countries like they want to join our membership. And we have more than 24 plus uh, people already on it. And in fact, in the Paris conference, we did workshop and also a, a kind of a uh, technical session, two sessions. Standing room crowd. In fact, at the end of end, I'm not just boasting in front of him, but at the end of the conference, the uh, key, the convener he mentioned, this sustainability is the one that's got a lot of attention from a lot of people. Next meeting in Korea, they're going to give us a bigger room. So I'm we're hoping hope we're going to have much more audience over there. Okay. So we talk about some of the sustainability topics in my first part of the presentation. Then I talk about two topics which recently we got funding. And I will talk about geothermal energy and also some induced seismicity, which I believe you, you guys are doing also. So sustainability, it's not like we want to jump on the bandwagon. You know, everybody says sustainability. So yeah, I think we want to do it. Really, I think in civil engineering, sustainability means a lot. I mean, if you go and Google sustainability, you get different definitions, OK? I mean, I don't want to go into the definitions of three circles, and you're the one that you know, encompasses all three circles of environment, economics, and soci societal uh, significance. And that's basically what is, it is. And of course, Deepanjan actually added a fourth element. But I'm going to really talk more on these three areas, environment, science, and economics, OK? So here, if you, if you look at it, uh, the area that we need is engineering, we should have environmental focus, which is very important, which we do have. Science, obviously, in engineering, we have science is embedded. Economics play a major role. 
life cycle cost analysis is very important. And then this is the one we lack a little bit, communication skills. We're not a good speakers. If you put an engineer in front of a, a city, or, or you know, okay, we are building a new road. Tell them why that uh, the road has to go through that uh, that particular neighborhood. Tell that neighborhood, you know, that they should accept it. It's not that simple for an engineer to go and talk to the, that that particular society or that particular group. It's going to be it's a lot of times we, you really have to explain them a lot more in depth, in detail. And that's where I think we need lacking. So it's very difficult for us as a, you know, if I want to show us real sustainability benefits, it was very complicated. Because I don't have the source communication. I mean, I do present two or three times in a semester, maybe as a part of my curriculum, but that is enough to talk in front of 50 people. I have students who froze to death in front of a large audience, you know? So how do you teach them? How do you train them? That's where my challenge is coming. So I think, you know, that's where we really have to, you know, you know the, we are talking about future civil engineering training needs to focus. You know, whenever I go, like right now in my current job, I work with College of Labor Arts. The communications, you know, there's a department. The folks work, the students coming from Department of Communication, they're excellent. They, they ex you know, give you their whole idea. You give them one minute, they will give you their pitch of the talk in one minute. If you give them five minutes, they can expand their talk to five minutes. You ask civil engineer to do the same thing, it's not that easy. I myself personally will fail also. You know? So it's not that simple. You have to learn how to talk. You know, some people have a lot longer span. You can go and explain them. If you are sitting in front of a board, all of them are engineers, you can explain them why that road has to be designed with the concrete pavement instead of asphalt pavement. You can explain them. But you go in front of a mayor and tell them why you want to do a, a road for like, you know, a, with the concrete pavement. You try to tell him in five minutes, he will lose interest completely. He will not even focus anything. I mean, he will probably rely on his advisors still. That's where as engineers, we, have to, we can make a better role by getting more communication aspects and societal aspects that will help us become a better sustainable civil engineers. That's one I really focus much more. Again, sustainability concept, it's really a global concept. It's enacted locally. So here in civil engineering, you know, I want to focus on sustainability in different areas. There are some areas that are very mature, water infrastructure. If you look at water, water is a very important part of it. You know? And most of the water you can always link with sustainability. You, know? you explain why dewatering, you know, why you have to do desalination. You can tell them the needs of the you know, growth of the population, explain the importance of you know, having a wells in that area. Those things are easy to, you know, the uh, people will understand. But in your, when you talk about infrastructure, Particularly when you're dealing with geotechnical and pavement, it's not that simple. You know, a lot of times people are against uh, a new infrastructure. I mean, I, understandably, it's not like if you're like, you know, why should I be in my, my neighborhood? Why, you know, why don't I, they take the road on the other side? I don't want the disturbance in my, you know, they do not understand the importance of optimizable benefit, maybe environmental issues, you cannot go through the other side, maybe there is a, you know, a lake nearby, it may, you know, certain reasons, you know, you have to explain all those things, then they'll understand it. So that's where geotechnical engineering and or mostly highway engineering, we really have to explain them how to improve their, you know, sustainability aspect. So here, you know, in geotech, if you look at this side is again uh, from Dipanjan. If you look at in, in sustainability, what areas in geotech or highway engineering we do, we listed several of them here. You know, energy geotechnics. You know, we can extract geothermal energy. That's a big benefit. You know, at one point, like uh, I was wondering, is it make sense for a, a residential home to have a, a geothermal energy? It costs extra 30, 40,000 or even more a homeowner to put extra in addition to his construction of a home, you have to put extra, do you think he liked that idea? Because it's gonna cost him a lot more at the upfront. You know, if you explain him, you know, he may recover some part of it very soon, he will understand it. You know, 30, 40 probably is not a good idea, but maybe some the industrial building, it'll make sense. A building like this, you know, if you extract geothermal energy, it's perfect because you see so many rooms here that you use every day. So you have to explain these things in a, in a way that way people will understand. And then you talk about material energy, type of materials reuse. All these things like a foundation reuse, rehab and reuse. We have foundations that actually, you know, uh, like in sometimes in a bridge, they're increasing, the traffic is growing so much, so they had to add extra lead. So sometimes we had to use existing foundation, reuse it. You know, how do we reuse them? You know, instead of re 
taking out that part? Can we add another foundation? Can we strengthen that outside area so that it can take extra load? Those are all, again, part of sustainability because you are trying to minimize new construction. You're doing this little new construction, but you're using existing foundation. That's the thing, you is the sustainability. So there are so many areas that where you're doing is the sustainability can be explained. Underground space, you know, some areas underground, like, you know, tunnels, they use a, a geothermal energy for lighting inside. You don't need to bring energy from outside. You know, some ground improvement, some, some of them we use the waste re, reuse material. That's, again, sustainability type of application. So if you look at infrastructure engineering, there's so many areas we do sustainability. We don't really emphasize a lot. But that's changing. We know in the last 10 plus years, you saw this rate, lead rating, you know, our green rating. So those are helping with the engineers and contractors, owners, together they come up with a ways of, you know, find a ways where you can enhance your sustainability in your project. So that's increasing now. So here my focus in the next few slides is gonna be showing on geotech and highway engineering. Most of the time we use is a reuse, reuse or recycle material. And that's where we get a lot of points for sustainability. So I spent quite a bit of my time here on talk about some waste materials which are reused or recycled. Some of them you are very much know, like coal combustion products. Many of times you heard about fly ashes, bottom ashes, you know, slags. These are very good to use if you show that there are no environmental you know, disadvantages. But you should not overuse them. There, are, there is a limit. You cannot go more than that limit, okay? That's something you have to know. The other one is actually recycled asphalt pavement and then recycled concrete pavement. When the pavements reaches their lives, like, you know, like when they have reached a certain time, instead of dumping the old pavement and then build a new pavement, you can reuse the whole uh, existing pavement, the old pavement, into a new pavement. And one of them is full depth reclamation. You know, FDR. And that's a very hot area, actually. You know, if you look at it, all over the world, they're using full depth reclamation or partial depth reclamation, where they use the old existing pavement. They crush that, pulverize that, and then stabilize that. They make that as a base layer. On top, they add a new layer. You know, and that actually gives the same life. So you're not actually throwing the material into a landfill. You're using existing one, and then you're building a new system which gives you again longer life and you know, much better infrastructure. You know? And then glass fibers and compost. I'll talk a little bit about this compost and some construction waste. And also I'll talk about a little bit of other topics here. So here is a uh, you know, uh, fly ash and bottom ash. The best way to know fly ash and bottom ash, fly ash is very fine powder material. Bottom ash is more coarse material, much more coarser. So fly ash is like your clay. Bottom ash is more like your sand, okay? So if it's a coarser material with a lot of uh, angularity, the bottom ash comes at a little different uh, process in the thermal power plant. Both of them have, believe it or not, as a pozzolanic material. So they are cementing material. They could be used with some cement or lime. You know, sometimes you need some alkali reaction to make them active. You could, pre you, you could make them a stabilized material. So here is some numbers here, okay? So if you look at here, you know, the, the amount of uh, waste we are producing in the coal combustion, huge amounts, okay? So there are so many issues with this thing, landfilling and the groundwater contamination. In you know, some areas, you, you, this is in Tennessee. So they actually they put all this material on the, on the outside there, the TVA Kingston fossil plant. The one thing, during flooding, the whole fly ash flooded the neighborhood, complete rehab is taking several billions. So you have to know how to use them, how to reuse them. So where are areas where we can try to use this coal? There's so many areas you can try. The one area is cement concrete pavements. You know, most, uh, most of the concrete in the past is used to some part of cement, you would remove it and add fly ash. Cement is obviously has a high carbon footprint. So you reduce some cement, adding fly ash, again fly ash itself has some you know, carbon material, but overall your carbon footprint will be less. So that's an, a good approach to do it. The other thing is flowable fills. Many projects in, high, in, in infrastructure, like new excavation of a pipelines, you know, at a bridge approach slabs, you use flowable fill because that's a material that easily flow into every uh, tra you know, trench you prepare and immediately sets, and it's a very good material. In some places, large embankments built inside the embankment, you know, core part of the embankment is made of fly ash. That's a big use. You know, if you put that one, but make sure that that embankment is never going to fail. If it does fail, it's going to create an environmental disaster. 
because you see that whole fly ash is gonna flood and it's come out because the minute the embankment is broke or something happened, the slope failure, massive slope failure, it could create a lot of environmental disaster, okay? Soil modification, this is where we do a lot of times lime and fly ash, cement and fly ash. We, we use a combined fly ash stabilization. In the, some pavement layers, we use also asphalt. And all other things, like geopolymer is another area where you look at it. Geopolymers are mostly made of fly ash. You know, and these are products are outside commercially available. You can use them. So by using these material in infrastructure projects, you're going to get some green benefits already because fly ash is a waste and you're reusing it. So you get some points. So most of the rating systems include a, a number, a metrics, how much points you get for material reuse. So if you have a project where you look at it and see if, if the owner, if you can convince him and if you work with your engineering techni technical group and then come up with various ways of using this uh, reuse, that's extra points. You know, so they promote this uh, reuse. Sometimes it may not be feasible because environmental issues may not let you use. So remember that. So it's not everywhere you will do it. And this is the recycled asphalt pavement. A lot of cities in, uh, in the U.S., you will see a lot of stockpiles of wraps, you know, which is, again, old concrete, old asphalt pavements taken and then removed and then crushed, pulverized, and then they dump them like this on the sides. A lot of city highway agencies, they try to use them as a base material. You know, sometimes they use with the treated, some with cement, or sometimes they don't use it, okay? So the wrap material is very common here we do. And then other things is crushed concrete, like this is the old bridge, they're breaking it. And you see how much amount of uh, aggregate that they produce. Again, these are mostly used, but a lot of times they're limited how much you can use in a, in a base material. For example, in our state, we limit 25% to 30% of this material, plus the remaining material should be fresh new aggregate material. So out of 100% total aggregate base, 30% only can be come from this material. The 70% has to be native, ag I mean, a kind of a new aggregate has to be. Because, I mean, in a, one of our study, we actually showed you can go up to 45 to 50% without compromising the quality. You know, but for a lot of states, they restrict the amount of usage, okay? I think with time, they probably increase the percentage threshold. The more you use, you know, without hopefully affecting as the base material performance, which you have to investigate in a lab and see the properties of the base material is satisfies what you're looking, then you could increase this thing, okay? So this part is, a, again, a wrap material is, in my opinion, is one of the, uh, you, you look at uh, wrap, uh, you know, cement treated wrap or lime treated, you'll see a lot of papers in this area. And it's been not just in one or two countries, all over the world. So they've been using it, they're promoting it, and again, uh, this is a major uh, reutilization of a re waste material. This aggregate, I had sometimes some issues. In some projects, when we use the old concrete aggregate or old cement concrete aggregates, what happened is this aggregate already has cement, so it has calcium. In one pro particular project, it didn't work. What happened is we put the aggregate as a base material. Underneath that base material, we have sulfate soil. We didn't realize that one, okay? What happened is the cement-treated aggregates, that bold aggregates, started releasing calcium into the underlying soil sulfate, okay? The, so so the sulfate is not good if you have, if you have soils have sulfate, it can cause a lot more problems. You have to check the sulfates for most of the geotechnical investigation. And the cement or calcium coming from the top layer, mixed with sulfate, it created a, for a, a mineral called ettringite. That ettringite is known as sulfate mineral that mineral started heaving. So this whole base material started cracking, okay? So the ba untreated soil started heaving, you know, and it started heaving because the cement came from, I mean, calcium came from the ba base material, mixed it with sulfate and started reacting and forming a tringite. And sometimes a tringite can bulk up two times its original volume. So a lot of times the roads were started heaving right in the middle. You know, the roads like started like breaking up like this. And so all, then when we did all the forensic investigation, we found out that natural soil has sulfates, but we didn't screen them. So if I do have sulfates, I wouldn't use this material as a, as a base material. I use this material as a base, because this has calcium, too much calcium, because it's already cemented material, right? So you have to look at the, all these things, and, but you know, there are areas where this can work very nicely, okay? So if you look here, again, I'm sorry, like I don't have Canadian numbers, but basically I'm pretty sure it's quite similar. 45 million tons is produced in, you know, 
a lot of waste. And again, we were looking for more and more areas of application. One area of application is MSC wall backfill material. A lot of retaining walls, the backfills are typically used as a, 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 a kind of a, a non-plastic material. Can you use an aggregate base? Can you use some of these materials? You could, you know, provided it works well with all the properties you're looking for. You could use them, and that is a good application as a MSC wall backfill material, okay? So here is where I'm listing some of the applications for the recycled material. You could reuse in the hot mix asphalt as, again, it's an aggregate-based material. This is where most applications are base and sub-base. Re retaining wall backfill I just mentioned. And then you can use them in the foundation courses, pipe bedding material. Like if you're designing a, a long pipeline project, excavated pipeline, you remove the soil, you, you need a bedding material. Sometimes you can use this re RCP or R, R, RAP material as a thing. You know. So these are the applications. And then sometimes you can, without removing and making them, this is the one I just mentioned. Is This, in my opinion, is probably one of the most green solutions that came out, full depth reclamation. The full depth reclamation is, again, the, if you look at the pavement, and the pavement is pretty badly deteriorated, what you could do is you go back and use some of the construction processes where you go back and crush the, some of the existing pavement and then some base and then some subgrade. So you're looking at several inches of depth, okay, several centimeters of depth. You go back and crush them and then mix them thoroughly in the field. And then you apply asphalt or, or cement or lime treatment to the material and remix again. And then apply some moisture and then go back and compact it. So this material will behave like a, almost like a stabilized base material. Then you put your upper surface on top. So the advantage is you're not removing the old pavement that's already broken, okay? You just use that one to create another structural layer. Okay, that's a major benefit. Right? You do not really have to, you know, imagine how many miles or kilometers of highway if you had to remove it and find a place to pay for it, landfilling. All these are savings for you now, okay? So that's the reason why the full depth reclamation is becoming very popular now, okay? Sometimes they do whole depth, sometimes they do partial depth reclamation. So again, there are other times people do, also do offsite processing where they have a big pug mill mixer comes they go next to, like you know, if you have an old pavement here, you bring that uh, whole uh, operation here. So you remove all these things, strip everything, and then put everything here, and this will process everything, prepare all your base material, force it back here, and then you prepare your base layer here, you can do it. And this is a little bit expensive offsite, but this is in situ process. Full depth reclamation is much more in situ process and much more popular. We did test uh, you know, one of our project, uh, these properties, and they're almost like a base material. You can see those numbers. And then the compressibility is also very low, you know, C sub C's and uh, uh, very low, so you would get very little settlements from this material. So in one of our projects, you know, State Highway 360 near D Dallas Fort Worth, what we did is in this particular section we used a wrap, okay, and we use also, in this side also we use another waste material. This is quarry fines, okay, which is again quarry. If you have a quarry aggregate source, you have fines which are dust, so you can bring them, but we cemented them. We stabilized them, and we used in both areas, we used a waste material stabilized or, not, or just used without stabilization in these pavement sections. And the sections were done as a part of a project. We monitored them for several, uh, day, almost uh, three months, three years, and then you can see all the inclinometers we placed in the highways. Students were collecting the data. The amount of settlements over the time of the years, like of traffic service, it's pretty low. We didn't have any issues. It performed as a nice pavement surface. So we actually published this particular paper in AC Journal of Materials. So it was a very good success. So now you see if you, uh, instead of Texas Highway Agent Systems, they use RAP quite a bit. They use, always try to find RAP applications in many of their highway projects. You know, in fact, there's one application I'm looking at is GeoCell. You know, it's a cellular type of GeoCell. Inside the cell, you can put aggregate. So instead of aggregate, we are looking at wrap material. This is glass. The glass is, again, we have a lot of glass type of waste glass. You know, you break glasses, so you get a lot of glass material can be reused. Because glass has some good reflecting characteristics. 
if, we, if they you know, make sure that it doesn't puncture your tires, but if you do it proper usage, you could get a very nice reflecting characteristics of your surface, pavement surface. So if you could use them, again, these are benefits for you, okay? And again, there are three types of recycled glass I mentioned here. I'll show you a, a little application. These two are interesting. These are from compost. One is uh, biosolids compost. The other one is dairy manure compost. Compost is what you use in your yards, right, to have a good, nice vegetation growth. So why are we interested in compost? There's a reason why we did this was dairy manure. I came from Texas. Texas has a lot of, you know, dairy. Right? We have a lot of uh, dairy, uh, you know, a lot of cows. In some areas, we have so, uh, so much of the manure that is produced. We wanted to try compost because if they don't do it, this manure is going into the river streams and it's polluting them. So we wanted to try the compost process and see if this compost can be used by mixing with the soil. Will that provide any good property? The reason we did is these two materials have hydrophilic characteristics. Hydrophilic means that they absorb moisture from atmosphere, okay? They take the moisture. So if you have a soil that has these materials, they absorb moisture. Believe it or not, you may get one or two percent moisture values. So if you have optimum moisture content of 14 percent, you may get 15 or 16 percent. Okay, so what? 14 to 16 percent, that's not a lot. It's a lot for us because in summer, one percent of moisture deficiency can cause a lot of cracking in high summer conditions, okay? So the lesser you have the, the, if you have any small amount of extra moisture, it will cut down my amount of cracking on our road infrastructure. The less cracking you have in our, on your soil, you have less cracking on your structure. So the roads don't have too much. So what we did is we used this compost material to create a, a, a soil mixture, and then we try to use them here. So here, this project here, where compost treatment was used on the shoulders, we mixed the soil with the compost and we put them on the shoulders. And the shoulders did not, because most of the time our cracking comes from shoulder. Shoulders cracks because they're open, they're exposed to the sun, they crack, and then that cracks go into the travel lane, the roads, then everything will get worse, okay? So we, we did a project, we demonstrated in a project we, the dairy manure did not work very well. Compost, biosolid compost worked very well. Okay. So why, why did the biosolids work better than dairy manure? Biosolids compost has a natural fiber, wood fiber. Okay, the biosolids compost comes from wastewater treatment plant. Okay, so it has a little bit more of a, like a bio material in it. So that vegetation helped with this moisture holding it. Plus, it helped with the vegetation growth. So the biosolid compost sections have a lot of vegetation. And when you have too much good vegetation, that will act like a, a good cover for the sun also. So when you have a very hot day, that section has lesser moisture loss than the section that has no vegetation, which is the other, other areas. So that helped actually. So we have hydrophilic from the compost material itself, plus the vegetation growth that came upon this material helped with this thing. You know, so this particular one here, what you see on the top is from Australia, different applications. These are some of the parking lots used with the crushed glass, recycled glass. So they use them in, a, in a, some of the applications to have a very nice uh, you know, texture material which gives you good reflection characteristics in the night, okay? This is another major problem in our highways. We have large cracks, large amount of cracking. And if you look at here, some of our desiccation cracks go up to five feet into the ground. Five feet is like 1.5 meters. You know? So 1.5 meters of uh, cracks, then first rain, boom, the whole water goes down, whole material gets soaked and saturated, and you have a slow failure. So we try to use, the, in this area, also biosolids compost. And it worked very well here. So this is our you know, uh, slope section in one of our dams, actually. We did uh, use a, you know, a compost here, 20% compost section here in this section. We instrumented and monitored the whole thing. Again, this helped actually very well with them. It actually helped a lot less than what it helped on the road pavement. Pavement has shoulders are much less slope. But this one is a little bit a steep slope. Uh, it did not, was OK, but not as effective as on the roads. But, Nevertheless, compost was used in the field to demonstrate that we can use as a waste material, we can reuse them, and then come up with a better solution. 
So as you can see here, most of the geotechnical projects, we can play a major role by turning waste into a sustainable solution. You got to come up with some novel ideas, okay? And again, you could use some of the materials, resources. I mean, I only touched a small part. If you look at it, there are much more materials, you know? And other things are geosynthetics. You know, some of the geotextiles you use, you know, you can cut down the amount of aggregate. So give you an example. If you are doing a, a road in a, a nice forestry road here, if I use a geotextile, my base layer can go from 20 centimeters to 10 centimeters <coughs> because I'm using a geotextile, right? I can put 10 centimeters less aggregates. That's a big cost benefit for that road because 10 centimeters of aggregate times five miles, I mean, six or seven kilometers of the of uh, the length, sorry, I always mix with miles and kilometers, right? So coming from US, okay. So if you look at it, kilometers of that thing, you convert everything cost. Aggregate is already expensive, plus when they produce aggregate, they crush them. During the crushing, a lot of energy, a lot of air pollution can create in an area. You know, have you ever been to any crushers area? How much dust they can create? All those are sustainable. You know, you can write some numbers to environmental impact. Those can be added, and you can see the benefits already. So adding a geotextile, you know, a geotextile has some carbon footprint too. Geotextile, <coughs> when you, the manufacturing process has some carbon footprint. So you can look at that carbon footprint versus 10 centimeters saving. Come and see which one is the most cost effective. So this is where I think as civil engineers have to start looking at, you know, come up with a better way of, you know, a product that can give them more sustainable solution. It challenges you. Okay, and it challenges you out of box thinking. And I think that's where you really need to look at it. Uh, again, geosynthetic uh, usage is very helpful now. Okay, again, um, I'm gonna give you some few case studies very quickly. Geofoam, and when we have a highway here, this is US 67, this is our test site. This particular bridge is actually has almost, uh, 35, 35 feet is how many? 35 feet. 10 meters. Uh, 10 meter height, 11. 10, 11 meter height embankment, okay? Which is pretty high embankment. And this embankment is settling, 16, five inches. That's again, convert that into almost like 45, 50 centimeter settlement over 15 years. So if the settlement is like the whole bridge is here, this is the road, the road is always settling. So the guys, instead of, they tried all kinds of solutions to lift the road, inject the, some kind of foam inside, all kinds of things. But the weight of the, this 11 meter is very high. It's causing the whole thing settling down, you know? So this is the settlement uh, that we marked. So we told them, let's try something different. You know, this is not a new technique, it's geoform. You know, we should try geoform. Geoform is a lightweight. So remove all the soil you have in the embankment, you know, one third of the soil, put these embankments, okay? So this is the first time they did a hybrid embankment. Most times you see the embankments are fully made of high geoform. But for this particular case, if I put full, embank, full height of embankment of geoform, the contractor, I mean the owner said it's too expensive, you cannot do. So I said, let's try one third. So we removed the top one third, the bottom is soil. You put the geoform and we put all the instrumentation, our group students, okay? And this is almost fourth year now. The amount of settlement in the last four years, you know, is less than one inches, or like I would say 35, 40, you know, like if you look at three to four centimeters. Very little settlements for four years. In the past, the four years, they used to have like almost six centimeters. Now we have less than four, you know, if you look at the number, you'll see around four centimeters. And it's very little now, they're like very happy with this because most of the settlements actually happened during construction. During performance, actually we stabilized already. We are not picking much settlements. We have a little bit of settlement in the last reading because we have a heavy rain in May, okay, in Texas. So we're gonna look and see whether that stabilizes or not. But nevertheless, this solution is very good because in the past, every time they have a repair, they had to shut down this one lane. And this is a heavy US, this, uh, one of this highway has so much of traffic. Every time they shut down, they have uh, big uh, trucks are standing and, and then you know, they're all polluting the whole air. You know, for like a one mile stretch of highway, like you know, have all the roads closed. Almost used to take three, four weeks to repair it. So when we explained them, okay, let's do this thing, cost, we'll look at it, and then when we showed it, 
Now almost four years, no closure. If in the past, if they left it as it is, in four years, they should have at least closed three times. That was their original records. Okay? So when we explain this benefit, you can put a, a, a number for a environmental benefits. Okay? You have less pollution. You have no traffic. Plus, remember, every time they close a lane, they have to hire extra people to do the traffic safety. Okay, one lane is closed, one lane, and then you have to have cones everywhere. You have to have people has to guide all those extra cars. So you have to do all these costs. None of the cost analysis models show this number. But when we explained everything, the area engineer said, okay, let's try. Because we, in the last 15 years, we tried everything that didn't work. We tried, and it worked. It's very successful now. And then now, now they're looking at other solutions. So the cost if you, is the only reason sometimes it's not going to make sense, OK? And this is one of the projects. This is where we have a 150-mile pipeline coming from this area, Lake Palestine. This is Dallas Fort Worth. So this pipeline is coming through so much of geological formations, OK? And we have so much, uh, some, some areas, the pipe is going to be around almost like a five meter below the ground. So we are excavating a lot of soil, and the pipe is pretty you know, large size, like, you know, uh, 2.74 meter di uh, diameter, you know, that's pretty large pipe. So it's excavating a lot of material. So all this material has to be taken out. And this site in Texas is, we are very well known for expansive soil, very bad soil, okay? So remove all the soil, we had to dump them in the landfill, okay? What we did, said is, well, let's try this as a CLSM, which is, a, is a, like a flowable fill, and put this around the pipe. So we designed this whole material into a flowable fill in the lab. They first said, you know, clay, this clay, you cannot use flowable fill, which they are partially right. Clay is not easy to use as a flowable fill. Silt is a good one. Sand and silts are good. But we thought, you know, this is, we had to try some solution. So we looked at some super plasticizers. So, and we have good grad students who are very patient, right? So they worked on a lot of different mix designs. So they came up with a solution. And in the field, we demonstrated this is the field mix. This is the pipeline. We poured the, uh, the flowable field nicely done. Everything was done. And then we checked the quality control. I was, you know, you know, our brave grad students go downstairs. And I was showing this one is our dynamic testing to look and see the stiffness measurements around the pipeline. You know, these are some of our numbers. In 28 days, very good stiffness with the flowable fill, which is providing good support to the pipeline, OK? So it was very perfect, you know, a good solution. You instead of dumping that whole excavator material, we are reusing that and then putting that back in the same trench, you know? Imagine this project of 150 miles, convert that into kilometers. I mean, it's not whole area is 15 feet uh, into the ground, but it's a lot of places buried pipe. So this is where we show there are a lot of benefits here, like you know, economic benefits because you save a lot of money reusing the same excavated fields. Environmental, remember, if I dump this in a landfill, I'm using a lot of landfill space. I'm, now I'm saving that. That's environmental impact. Societal impact, this pipeline is coming through small, small towns. If the small towns are using quarry material coming from trucks, remember what happens to their roads their roads will get damaged very quickly because they're not designed for this quarry, right? So societally, I mean, when we show this to explain them, they would have loved this solution. They would definitely like this solution. So we showed this thing, and then we showed some carbon footprint. You know, our students showed the calculation. If you use the material cost, OK, the first thing is if you do material completely from excavator site, this is what the cost. If you take it from outside using quarries, this is the cost. So you see already six, seven times. And then you look at the carbon, this is per meter. Carbon footprint with uh, using reusing, 0.01 versus 0.08. That's eight times. So we did this analysis, OK? And this is the, what the, the project got. Uh, what, you know, this is from the ICI, ISI Envision Silver Award for this pipeline project. And this is the citation. They mentioned here, they involved the civil engineering graduate students at the UTA who evaluated this thing. So we're happy. They, used, they cited our work in giving this award to that project. We did research for them. And we demonstrated in the field. All because this is something we, we know we can try. It's not that we, we know for sure it's going to work at the beginning, but we know we can try. Okay? So this is a good solution where you can take something from a research into real practice. You know, as a success, in a successful solution. 
So I'm going to move to the last few slides of my two topics, which I think, you know, geothermal energy. You know, we have two new projects on these topics. It's ongoing. I don't have a lot of uh, high important information yet, but I think in the future I may have more data. But you may laugh because in Texas, when we have snow, we close our roads. Okay? We have a lot of elevated bridges. Okay, we like to say we have a lot of flyovers, right? But what happens is when it comes snowing, they become treacherous. They become very, they're frozen. They're mostly concrete pavement. So it's, they, you cannot use them. So most times we shut down our roads. As a result, like, you know, uh, in the last three, four years, we're losing six to seven days of, like, you know, whenever the, I mean, my kids love it because they have no school, you know? So, but I had to find, I had to take a leave because I, my school doesn't shut down. I had to go to school, they, you know? Uh, but I had to come back and take care of them, right? It's not that simple. So here, 2015, six day closures, fatal crash, you, know, you can see here. You know, all these things, because we're not like, you know, we're having more and more snow coming in, in these days than we had before, okay, more snow days, okay? So if you ask the children, they love snow days, okay? But not for the parents, because, and then, you know, you remember, we sh shut down everything, so, so what we thought is if we have elevated bridges, we cannot replace them anyway, we have already built them, right? So why don't we use a geothermal energy and then, maybe put some system where the bridges can be heated a little bit. So that way we don't, we can open the bridges to the traffic, okay? So we were looking at geothermal energy. Geothermal energy concept is very simple. You have a, this is shallow geothermal. We're not talking about deep, you know? So just to go at uh, below a few feet down, your temperature in the ground is constant. So put a, two, lives, two types of pipeline system. So you recirculate water from the top, then convert everything into ground source heat pump that can be used to, power, to generate power that can heat your bridge decks, okay? So that's what we are. So this is the technology they use, ground source heat pumps, you know, hot water, cold water pipelines, you know, this could be connected with a pipe, with a deep foundation energy piles you can do, or you can do it in a different ways. You can do like a, a horizontal loop, you know, you can do all kinds of things. So we were proposing this to our Texas DOT, Department of Transportation. They're very, very, TxDOT is really like, a, very creative. They want some new cutting edge research. So we're very fortunate this particular project, we were picked out of six schools, you know, we were picked to do this work. We're doing the preliminary phase analysis. <coughs> and then if they, if they liked our work here, we make do the real full scale validation, full, full scale demo testing. You know, right now we're looking at different techniques, okay? And including what type of fluid should be used so that we get more recovery out of it, and that can be used so that we can use to heat the bridges. So before we're doing it, we're looking at some of the works done all over the world. So some, like, it's not like, you know, some in Swiss, they already used, uh, oops, like here, you can see here, uh, this particular bridge, they use the uh, pipes from this particular area to get that, you know, uh, uh, the geothermal energy and then to heat it. You can see here, the outside area is frozen, inside it looks like working nicely. You know, and this is in uh, uh, Japan. Again, you can see walkways, okay? They used uh, the geothermal systems. You can see here outside you have snow. Inside is uh, nicely heated side sidewalks. is working well. Again, in Germany, you have also similar systems they use, including some pictures, infrared pictures of uh, showing you the areas that are hotter, you know? And you can see this thing from a comparing outside. So, Again, this is a, a, when, we, when we were looking at it, we found out there's one study done in Texas. It was, it was done several years back. So it, it was done on an Amarillo Bridge. You know, we are using that information. But in the last 15 years, there's so much of developments in this particular field, okay? There's still some issues, which is uh, the heat pump is still expensive. It still doesn't make cost sense. You know, when, we speak, when I spoke with some, prof, some practitioners and also some faculty, uh, in a conference in Austria, they were telling us in a lot of uh, Austrian homes and in that part of the area, they do most of the residential homes, which is not a big home, they do have geothermal systems. And they said within three, four years, they will actually start seeing the benefits already. That means the cost, whatever they put, three, four years, you know, three, four months, I mean, three, four years, they already, after that, it starts showing savings for them, okay? And I think in our case, probably not yet, but it's coming close to that five, six years or even more, okay? So we are, this is our project. We are looking at different techniques. We are also looking at the fluids that can generate more. 
And this is where we are right now in the, in the, uh, the thing. And we're going to be doing some cost benefit analysis, life cycle analysis. And I think this is a, a nice project. You know, if we can demonstrate, I don't have to, we don't have to, I mean, the kids won't like it, but you know, we don't have too many snow days, right? So, and the other one is, again, now we, in the lab, we are doing a lot of TDR work, you know, time domain refractometry. One of my, my colleagues is doing this work. We're doing the, in addition to the pipe, you know, you have to know the thermal conductivity properties. So we are using this into a finite element simulation. So this is a lab testing part of it in our lab, okay? So this will come very soon. Now I'll talk, talk about another energy-related topic, is induced seismicity. Induced seismicity, again, uh, there, there are many reasons why you have a, induced seismicity is man-made seismic problem. Okay, natural seismic event, you know, all the f faults moving up, you know, those are natural seismic. Induced seismicity can come from different, uh, different uh, regions. Like if you have a large reservoir, a large dam, that's storing a lot of water, it's a huge amount of energy that's stored there. In that area, whenever you have a new construction of a, such a dam, you will see some seismic tremors gonna take place, okay? And other things that are happening nowadays, you heard about is wastewater injection, okay? And that's gonna trigger some seismic events, okay? And also geothermal has some seismic. So we were looking at like, you know, the, this is something we recently have, because we are not designed our structures for seismic, so we want to see if there is a seismic event. How do we check it? So this is our project. You know, man-made earthquakes. Again, there are some history, like you know, this in you know, South Africa. They mentioned one of the during tunneling, they have some. They created some man-made triggering that you know kind of caused some problems. And again, if we show you, even in Texas, we have some areas. And again, as I mentioned about sometimes when you have dams that store huge amount of water is equal, equivalent to energy that will cause sometimes some fall starts crossing or slipping, you will have some seismic event, okay? So this is one you want, I wanna show you here, okay? This is, if you look at it, these are relatively like an M around three, okay? This is a, up to 1973, this is what the earthquakes here. Uh, it's my grad student actually, like a PhD student working on this topic. And these are earthquakes that are happening here. I want you to uh, watch this, all these areas where there is a you know, way, different type of man-made activities happening. These are all the USGS uh, new recent earthquake. Most of them are M M's are around three, so remember that, okay? So still less felt like earthquake. Just in Oklahoma, if I just to show it to you, so a lot of activity in Oklahoma. So if you look at Oklahoma, state of Oklahoma, a lot of seismicity is happening, so they're already looking at seismic uh, related thing. And in our area, you know, it's, uh, this circle, you didn't see it very well, but you, it, this is where we are, the, the Dallas. We do have some in significant uh, uh, earthquake activity, not magnitude-wise. Magnitude is still small, two to three, in the Richter scale, but we do see quite a bit of activity. So our structures are not designed for this seismic, so we need to look into it. So that's what we are trying to see, whether we need to you know, look at it. Again, there are different uh, phenomena, you know, some of them mentioned about fluid pressures going inside, the wastewater fluid, that fluid can trigger falls to start slipping at one another, and then that will create an induced seismic. And there are different type of things. You can look at them in the literature, you know, from Ro this nice paper by Rubinstein Mahani. It'll, it'll give you a little bit of more information on this. So basically what we are interested in this thing is, this is one of our uh, n nice, beautiful dam. You know, it's a, a large amount of wa water comes from here. We are trying to see if I have certain types of earthquakes of magnitude. Right now we're up between two and three, but we want to look at hypothetical case and see if if any of the slopes are going to have issues of liquefaction, dynamic slope stability, and also lateral spreading. So these are three er things we want to look at and investigate. You know, and uh, there are other types of things also important, but these are the first three are we are focusing on. You know, this particular dam has steep slopes, and we want to see if, if there's an issue or not. So for this particular project is very challenging because the dam has a lot of uh, huge length. I don't have all the geotechnical data. We only have test set done at different depth, at different intervals. So you have to build a spatial model. Okay, so geostatistics we are using to do a spatial correlation. And that will build me the, like a ground truth of my whole dam. So it will give me all the layers properties. Then I have to assume a probabilistic analysis of a s s earthquake. So I have two types of uh, reliability. Reliability on the soil side, soil property side. Reliability issues on my probabilistic issues on the earthquake type of earthquake also. So together we come up with a framework 
to come up with, look and see if there's an issue. If there's an issue, we will tell them well, how do you, they can uh, strengthen that area. So th that's the whole goal of this project. So this project actually just started. So it's, it's a pretty new project. We're doing this dam, and also this side we have a levee. So we're doing quite a bit of this work, actually. So, so it's a pretty interesting project for us. We have two PhD students who are going to work on this thing. And we're looking at these three areas predominantly. Okay? Again, this will help them to come up with a better design. Again, as I said, North Texas is not a seismic area. So, but now we have the induced seismicities happening. So we need to check and see the most critical infrastructure. Dams are critical lifeline infrastructure. They provide water for the people. They provide recreation, everything. So you want to see if there's an issue, we need to address that. And that's what this whole project is about. Okay. So basically, this is what it is. So it's sustainable, I want you to start thinking in that sense again. It's not about jumping on the bandwagon. It's much more than that. You know, we want you to look into different thinking. You know, see where we can try. You know, there are a lot of things that you do. You do not know their sustainability. You know, you should go and ask. You know, Dr. Basu or several folks and see. Yeah, if I think like this, is that okay? I want you to start thinking that way. Because if we, the more we do, uh, you're going to be the future engineers. You're going to be the ones to help with the project to get a rating. So it will help the project and it will help you and your your future generation, OK? Again, uh, we do need this information more. Me and uh, uh, Deepanjan always talk about carbon calculators. We have so far, these are developed by outsiders. But we need uh, more independent assessments, vetting, you know? And that's where I think we have our challenges. You know, obviously, this is something we will probably learn much more. This is just real. In Texas, we have sometimes some unexpected. This is uh, one of the projects where I was putting the geoform. This is my Thai student, PhD student. He's, collect, he's taking the reading, trying to push the probe. We have a, a snake, actually. This is a, we learned it's a poisonous snake by looking at the face. Okay? And he was pushing it, and he couldn't go. It felt like small, soft uh, touch. It's something, when he pulled it, he coiled that in, uh, inclometer. He jumped 20 feet. And this is a guy who is uh, from Thailand, knows all the king cobras, but he was scared of this. Okay? So, so this is where my campus is. I'm in the Dallas-Fort Worth right here. This is our campus. Again, these are some of my agencies. These are the big ones that fund our projects. Okay. So I'm happy to answer. Again, I think uh, I want to say thank you again, Basu, Armugan, everyone. These students helped me with some presentation. Okay. So with that, I'm happy to answer your questions. Very good question. And the question is, it looks like in that picture, you only saw a small strip. If you look at it, there are four other methods. That was a research investigation. So what we did is for uh, the project, the core project on the dam, we wanted four different treatments. One of them is lime, lime plus fibers of two types, then compost. And then one of the sections is we didn't do anything, control. Okay? So we have four plus one control section, five section. And we monitor that section and, and the thing. Now, if it's worked, that compost, it worked OK. It wasn't uh, top three performers. It's the fourth, actually. Lime and dollar worked much better than this thing. Even the compost helped with vegetation. L compost didn't provide uh, the best benefit in that particular project. It provided me the fourth best. But if that would have been the top two, they would use the next time the slopes would have been completely done with the compost. OK? Yeah. And we on the roads, which have uh, almost shoulders are like this flat, very small, it worked perfect. Okay? And the dairy menu did not work, but biosolid compost cut down my cracking because it helped me with vegetation. It also helped me with cutting down the cracking. Okay? Now we have a paper in AC Journal of Geotech. If you look at AC Journal of Geotech, compost, comma, pupala, you will find it. Okay? And we clearly showed it from our statistical significance test. We monitored data from moisture. Under the compost fiber, I mean, under the biosolids compost, we always have two or three points more moisture content than the section that doesn't have that compost section. OK? So one or two moisture points more is already helpful to cut down your cracking. RAPs have more life than RCP. It's uh, difficult to say that because I didn't assess them side by side. And they're different process we assessed it. But I could say RAP have a little bit more moisture. Um, 
it all depends on the gradation, OK? Uh, the more survivability depends on the gradation, actually, in the case of base, OK? If it's a RCP does come with cemented material, it may get I mean, may get cemented a little bit with time, OK? It will probably provide me like a cemented base. RAP, on the other hand, has a good drainability. It will survive longer, OK? Uh, the reason is RAP is, uh, doesn't have cement inside. I mean, you put one or two percent, but that's not going to make it complete cemented. So RAP will work. Base, the most important base, uh, base material is to provide structure support plus to provide drainage, quick drainage. Okay? So RAP provides me better quick drainage than RCP. So for that reason, I would say, yeah, RAP probably provides better performance, durability performance-wise. Okay? RCP always have some issues. But I still think they're, they're good to be as a waste material. Okay? I just don't want to use them if my soil underneath it has sulfates in it. You know, I would, don't want to use them. Okay? Any other questions? Okay, I can say your vacation starts. <laughs> all right? Thank you again. Thank you all. Okay. <laughs>